Now we welcome into our midst a smiling face and a <laughs> infectious laugh. Thank you. Pastor <laughs> Jones. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much. You're welcome. First of all, I want to thank you for reading those scriptures on strength. Um, because one of the things I'm going to talk about uh, is the strength uh, that God commands us to have and the fear that he commands us to release today. Uh, I want to thank uh, Sister Harriet for speaking about the prophetic word that was given. Um, I, I didn't know who it was that owned that silver carp, but I did remember the prophetic word that was given during that service. And uh, I am grateful for her uh, safety. I'm grateful f that it was only the material things that uh, were destroyed. And I even spoke to Harriet during the week, and I'm not sure if I spoke to her before or after, but um, she was just in, a, in in her normal place. So <laughs> praise the Lord. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Well, after I spoke to you on Monday, that we had the accident. <laughs> <laughs> I see. I see. So today I am going to ask you to enter into a time of listening. I'm going to ask you to enter into a time of acting. I'm going to ask you to enter into a time of reflection with me and just being able to receive the word and uh, allow God to share with you the word and to receive it the way God wants you to receive it. Whatever is to strike you, let it strike you in the way that it should. Notice the verses, uh, notice the statements that connect with your heart. Use that as an opportunity uh, to build. I am always looking to inspire. Um, I'm always looking uh, to inspire you to go on a journey of transformation, not just belief. Although belief is really important, transformation is really the key. Tra transformation is our salvation. So um, I also want to offer my condolences to Pastor Catherine and her family. And I say it is a time to celebrate. Um, over the last little while, we've had we've experienced quite a few transitions. I use the word transitions uh, because to me, death is is not the right word. Uh, I want to acknowledge that death is not our end, and we know this. Uh, but it's our moment or our movement back to the spiritual beings that we are. Uh, there's a Jesuit priest named Pierre Card Tilhard Cardin, and he said this about life. He said. We are not human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. So our beginning is spirit and our journey is human and our end is the return to the spirit. So what is this human journey all about? What are we su supposed to accomplish while we are here? I've entitled today's message, hold the light and walk in the light. And the reason why I call the message this particular title is I was in a time of meditation earlier this week, actually on two different days. And the first day I was in my time of meditation and just silently just being with God. And it was amazing how the room lit up so much so I had to open my eyes because I thought is the sun shining on me, but it was really an internal light that I was seeing. And the message came, hold the light. And uh, I attempted to hold the light as long as I could, but there was a, a bit of a darkness that moved across so that I could no longer hold the light. And then a, a day or two later, I was in a time of meditation again, and the message that came was walk in the light. So this morning, the message is hold the light, walk in the light. And I'm gonna ground today's message in the text found in Matthew 5 verses 14. Uh, to 16. And I'm going to read that now uh, from the Amplified Bible. And as much as you can, keep up with me in the passages of Scripture, at least write down some notes about the ones that I speak to you about. And you can feel free to go back and uh, re-listen to this recording, but also go back and read those Scriptures and see what comes forward for you. We're all in different stages of maturation. What is going to be the word for me is not necessarily going to be the word for you, but the same text can offer the same message to all of us, right? So Matthew 5, verse 14 to 16, reading from the Amplified Bible, it says, You are the light of Christ to the world. 
A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good deeds and moral excellence and recognize and honor and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So before I go any further, I just want to, I want us to just stay in the word. Notice the way that this passage of scripture ends. Glorify your father in heaven. We're going to look at some scriptures that's in Revelation. And I want you to notice that when the light is present in us, it means there is glory that is given to the father. But before we proceed, let's pray. Heavenly father, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for who you are. We give you thanks that you are the light, you are the life, and you are the love of this world. We give you thanks that you have placed your spirit of light within each of us. We give you thanks that you illuminate us, you even reveal to us with an illumination and a light the passages of scripture that are to imprint on our hearts and our minds and everything that surrounds us. So in this moment, Father, May the essence of who you are, the light that you are, may it offer revelation to those who are listening. May the light allow us to see into places that we have not been able to see before. May the light permeate our very being and allow us to once more shed off the darkness and to step more boldly into that place where you want us to be. May you bless each heart. May you bless each mind. May you bless the truth centers of each being that is on our platform this morning. May you bless those who will listen to this message afterwards. May you fill us up, fill us up with your light. Allow us to hold it. Allow us to walk in it. In Jesus' name, amen. So I've asked you a question. What are we to accomplish on this human journey? But let me reposition the question and ask it in a slightly different way. What will they say about you when you die? Will they celebrate you and say, well, there goes a good spirit who understood what the journey was all about. They held the light. They walked in the light. Or will they wail and will they mourn? Not because you're gone, but because they know this spirit didn't understand the point of this journey. They certainly did not know their position or play their part well. Because this is what we mourn. In the most difficult and trying times when somebody dies, it is not so much that they're gone. It is, it is often the fact that the relationships we should have had with them wasn't what it is. And with the families that fall apart, and there's always chaos after someone dies, the person who dies is potentially the one who is holding it all together. But sometimes even the one who is holding it all together didn't do it so well, didn't give such great examples. And that family is unable to cope in these times of trouble. Will they remain silent? Just like your life or the life you lived. The journey was uneventful. It included no adventures. You certainly ruffled no feathers. The world you entered, the community you entered, the family you entered remains unchanged. Will they say, well, certainly he was here or she was there. We're sure of it, but we can't speak to what they changed. I am going to suggest that the purpose of life is threefold. And I have no particular order to how I'm gonna list these because I don't think there's a particular order. It's just something that we have to accomplish. Number one, through our experience in this life, we are to come to an understanding of the difference between good and evil, and we are to choose goodness. Number two, we are to become Christ. That's what the word says. That comes from 1 John 4, verse 17, thereabouts. In this life, we are to be like Christ. 
We are to be Christ is actually how it says it. We're to embrace the light of Christ. We are to walk in the light of Christ. We are to unite with the light. We are to become one with the light. We are to hold the light for others. Number three, we are to love completely. And we are to live fearlessly. I'm going to suggest that if we accomplish these three things, we will have walked the path that God has set for us and we will have changed the world profoundly. This past week, as I was talking about earlier in my time of meditation, I was going through a self-healing exercise. I do this every day. It's called balancing. And I have an actual activity for doing this. I have an activity for testing if I need to forgive somebody. I have an activity to test if I have a belief that I need to correct. I have an activity that helps me identify certain aspects of myself that shouldn't be there, that are actually blocking me from doing certain things. And once I assess it, then I have to go through the healing process. And so Holy Spirit was offering me that message through that process. Hold the light. Walk in the light. When I asked Pastor Catherine what she wanted me to speak on, she said, go with whatever, you know, the Lord's doing in your life right now. So when our loved ones transition, it becomes a wonderful time to reflect on the journey, what it's about and how we achieved it. And so since she's going through that and I'm going through this moment with the light, I'm going to offer a message that combines uh, a reflection on death and life and light. Let's go back to the Garden of Eden and look for the why. Why should we learn the difference between good and evil and then choose goodness? Turn with me to Genesis uh, chapter 2, verse 15 to 17. So the Lord, and I'm reading again from the Amplified Version. So the Lord took the man he had made and settled him in the garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, you may freely, unconditionally eat the fruits from every tree of the garden, but only from the tree of the knowledge or the recognition of good and evil, you shall not eat. Otherwise, on the day that you eat from it, you shall most certainly die because of your disobedience. Notice the freedom of the garden. Notice the richness of the garden. The only restriction is don't choose death. Choose life. So I'm not, I'm not going to say the only restriction is don't eat the fruit. That's not what the message is. The message is don't choose to die. But let's take another look at another passage of scripture. Let's look at Genesis 3 verses 22 to 23. So this is after Adam and Eve have now eaten the so-called fruit and they have chosen death. And the Lord said, behold, the man has become like us, father, son, and Holy Spirit, knowing how to distinguish between good and evil. And now he might stretch out his hand and take from the tree of life as well and eat its fruit and live in this fallen, sinful condition forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent Adam away from the Garden of Eden to till and cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So there's two trees in the garden. There is the tree of good and evil and there's the tree of life. Let me ask you this question. And while I ask the question, I'm going to ask everyone to respond. I want to see your chat or I want to see or I want to hear your response. If you have the choice between living forever or living a life where you become like God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and just like God, you know the difference between good and evil, and you're just like God. What would you choose? There's no fall. You just are like God. What would you choose? Would you choose to live forever, the eternal tree of life? 
Or would you choose the knowledge of good and evil? How would you choose? I want some of you to open your mics, those who are brave enough. I see Harriet says the tree of life. The tree of life. Yeah, that's a good My question, choice. Harriet. I, Harriet says, I wonder why Eve didn't eat from the tree of life. Yeah, they were both there. But she right? wasn't given. She wasn't given the tree of life. Oh, no, they were given the tree of life. It was there. It was, it there. was there, but they weren't supposed to. And the devil gave her the tree. No, of read the text. Earth. Read the text. The text says you can freely eat of anything. The only one you cannot eat from is the tree of knowledge. Right. That's the instruction. And the tree of life. They were the eating that every day. Huh? That was the daily, daily uh, um, I guess, uh, food. Mm hmm. So they were eating the tree of life every day. So every day. That, what is the tree know. of life then? What is the tree of life? Uh, I believe it would be uh, like being in the presence of God because that's what they lost. Mm -hmm. Very good. Very good. Brother Edwin, you said? The tree of life. The tree of life. Stephanie, okay. you said? Oh, the same. To live. Yeah, choose to live in forever, right? <laughs> so, yes. I would, so I choose the tree. Ann, what would you choose? Come on, don't be shy. Would everyone choose the tree of life? Of course. Yeah. The tree of life is that the one thing? <laughs> um, that's where we uh, we choose to be like God. Mm -hmm. Okay. The tree of well, the, the the way that it says in the scriptures. Okay. You want to read the scriptures, and you want to read the scriptures. It says okay. as as God responded in that three, verse twenty two. Right. It says, "Behold, the man has become like, like one of us, Father, okay. Son, and Holy Spirit, knowing how to distinguish between good and evil." Now, the only problem God had was that they might now eat from the tree of life as well. And live forever. That's a tree. Forever in their fallen state, right? In their fallen state. Okay. So there's a number of different ways we can interpret that scriptures. Were they eating from the tree of life all along? Because it was there, yeah, but yeah, not God was concerned, right? Yeah. Can I tell you a secret? Yeah. We no longer have a choice. The choice was made for us a long time ago by Adam and Eve, and also by God. And now we have to travel the path. We must come to a place where we understand what goodness looks like. We must also understand what evil looks like. And once we understand it, we must now choose goodness. Not only that, we must cho choose a holy goodness, not just a sense of being good, but a sense of being holy. Not only that, we must choose to become the very image and character of Christ or God, who is the tree of life. So God has taken something that could have been this monumental moment of destruction and through that same path that we have chosen, he is now going to bring us into the place where we could become the very character of who he is. Let's turn to Revelations 22 verses one to five for some greater insights on the tree of life. In the NIV version, the chapter heading is Eden Restored. And in the Amplified Bible, it is called the perfect life. Each speaks to New Jerusalem. Revelations 22 verse 1 says, Then the angel showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb Christ. New Jerusalem is a spiritual state of overcoming remember the samaritan woman she was offered the water of life at the well when she spoke to jesus here we see that the river the source of life comes from two places it comes from the throne of god and the throne of christ let's move now to revelations 22 verse 2 in the middle of its street 
on either side of the river was the tree of life bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. The river described in Revelation right here is also described in Genesis just before it talks about Adam and Eve. The tree of life is not clearly described in Genesis, but we know that it was present and Adam and Eve had access to it. Notice the number 12 in this passage of scripture. The tree bears 12 kinds of fruits, okay. one for each of the 12 months of the year. The last time I spoke to you, I spoke to you about identifying which of the 12 tribes you belong to, because that's what the tree is, is the 12 fruits are referring to. And as you dive into the Hebrew symbols, notice the months on the Hebrew calendar in which you were born. That takes it one step further. So isolate which of the tribes do I belong to? Look at the ways in which your life has 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 travailed. Look at the experiences that you've had. Look at the successes that you've had. Look at the blessings that have come. Look at the failures that you've experienced. And you will be able to identify with tribes or one or more tribes. And then beyond that, notice what month you are born in. I know that my life experience, as I've told you before, belongs to the tribe of Joseph. So Ephraim and Manasseh are called the two half tribes of Joseph. I belong to both. So I pray specifically for the blessing of Joseph, but I know that I belong to both, both tribes. February 7th is my birthday, which corresponds to the month of Shabbat. And when you go back and you begin to study the months in the Hebrew, the original Hebrew, there are symbols that go along with them, much like we have symbols in the Gregorian calendar that we use. So Shabbat or February is the fifth month of the Hebrew year and has a set symbol. It's a bucket and it corresponds to the sign of the Aquarian, right? The, the Aquarian is water. If you were born in February, you are a container, like a bucket or like a well. You are the holder of the water of life. It's important for you to go back and look at some of these symbolism. Water quenches the thirst. It was why Jesus said to the Samaritan woman, if you drink the water I give you, you will never thirst again. It cleanses, it purifies, it gives eternal life as we are seeing. It also gives new birth. In John 3 verse 5, Jesus says to Nicodemus, I assure you and I most solemnly say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Let's move on to Revelations 22 verse 3. There's no longer, there no longer exists anything that is cursed because sin and illness and death are gone and the throne of God and the lamb will be in it and his bond servants will serve and worship him with great awe and joy and loving devotion. This is the destination we are to come to in this human journey. We are to come into our own Jerusalem. They will be privileged, going to uh, verse four and five now, they will be privileged to see his face and he will name and his name will be on their foreheads. So remember, there's always mention of the mark of the beast. Well, his name will be on our foreheads. So there's a mark of Christ and there will no longer be night. They will have no need for lamp light or sunlight because the Lord will illumine them and they will reign as kings forever and ever and ever. Once you reach this state in your spiritual journey, there is a light within you are illuminated by God you simply shine. So we've seen the beginning and we've seen the end, but what does the in-between look like? How do we come to understand the difference between good and evil? Evil is defined by the Merriam-Webster dictionary as something that brings sorrow. That's it, it brings sorrow. So sometimes we think, well, sorrow comes from people, it comes from places, it comes from things. But can, can places really bring us sorrow? No, not really. Not unless we choose to enter a place that is dangerous and because we don't actually listen to our own intuition, then we become harmed. I remember watching this show where there were some tourists who went to a particular place in Hawaii um, and there was an active volcano. 
And it just so happens that the volcano erupted while they were on that island. And like skins literally melt, melted off people's bodies because of, of that heat. That brings sorrow. Do things bring sorrow? No, not unless we use it inappropriately. So an ax can be used to chop wood. It can also be used to kill or to harm someone. Yeah. Do people bring sorrow? Only under one condition. Their behavior. That's right. If they do not look like God. Mm. When you love completely, when you look like God, you do not bring sorrow. This is the destination. So are you catching on yet? We only come to understand the difference between good and evil when we experience each other. You and I. In the Bible, evil is defined um, in such a way that it talks about it's morally wrong. Something is sinful or wicked. Other definitions suggest that the word evil also refers to anything that causes harm with or without the moral dimension. I think the best definition comes from Psalms 51 verse 4. Evil is anything that goes against God and your spiritual nature. So let's dive a little bit deeper. Can you recall the first time you encountered a person you would call evil? They brought you sorrow. What did they do? What did they say? How did they act? In that moment, did you know and understand the reason for the encounter? This, did you know that this was your moment to learn the difference between good and evil so that you could then discern what goodness looks like and choose goodness? Did you know that you were about to make a choice? There's a powerful passage in the scriptures in Revelations 12 verse 10. And I want you to draw your attention to it now. I want to show you that after we encounter evil, we will have a choice between giving up our faith in God and rising to a new level of faith. When we give up our faith in God, we are choosing death. And when we hold on with dear life and choose to rise out of it, no matter how long it takes, we're choosing life. This is coming from Revelations 12 verse 10 to 11. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom, the dominion, the reign of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our believing brothers and sisters has been thrown down at last. He who accuses them and keeps bringing charges of sinful behavior against them before our good day, our God day and night. And they overcame and they conquered him because of the blood of the lamb and because of the word of their testimony. For they did not love their life and renounce their faith, even when faced with death. When you experience evil, it will wound you so deeply, your heart will break. And in this moment, a state of despair and grief and oppression will overtake you. In this moment, a temptation presents itself and you will make a choice. Here's your choice. Like a wave, the evil will overtake you. And while you are in the wave, the water has totally consumed you. While you are in it, you become it. And you will die because you choose to abandon your true nature. There are so many people in the world who've experienced a traumatic moment, a kind of evil that consumed them. And in that moment, they became it. They left themselves, they abandoned their true nature, and for the rest of their lives, all they did was give sorrow to other people. Number two, the evil will overtake you, but you will fight with all faith 
and you will overcome it. You will choose your faith the whole way through it. You will hang on for dear life. You will choose your faith and you will live. You will not abandon your true nature. There's a third option. The evil will overtake you like that wave. <clears throat> it will wound you so deeply. And for a very, very long time, you will stay under that wave. Some will say you walk through your desert. This is the 40 years in the desert that Israel had to move through. But through Christ, through the lessons that then come, through the patterns that develop in that moment, you will rise once more. You may choose for a moment to abandon yourself or you may think about it, but you will come back and you will come back even stronger. These are the choices. And I wanna give you an example of the choice that I made at the moment that I encountered evil. I wanna read you um, a passage from my book, 490, Forgive and Live Fearlessly. I'm gonna read it to you because it's, it's a pretty powerful picture that I paint in the book and I can't quite remember all the words so I can't quite say it as well as I did in the book. And I'll warn you that the story is, um, has many layers to it and parts of it can be jarring so I want to prepare you for that as well. So people have different responses to this. Uh, some people have similar experiences and so what you'll find is that you know the same kind of responses that you might have had in your own experience that they come up. So depending on where you are on your healing journey, you might have different responses like anger or a bit of shock or panic. Um, some have never had an experience like this, so they won't know how to relate to it. Um, if this is you, you may enter a space of distancing yourself psychologically, uh, and that's okay to do that. Or you may wonder why, um, why somebody uh, would even speak about this in a book uh, in relation to themselves and their mother. Um, I'm going to talk about my mother in this story. And so what I want you to know is my mother is already forgiven. <laughs> my mother and I have reconciled. My mother is now dead and gone, and she is in a good place. She and I tell the story now. So don't, don't go to that place where um, you, you begin to shame and blame. Some other people are filled with compassion for me. And, you know, so they're able to step into my shoes. They're able to see from my perspective. Um, and they might even want to comfort me. And so, again, this is a healed place that I come to you from. It's not a place that requires, I'm so sorry you had to experience that. Um, but thank you. Thank you for thinking about that. So listen to my story. Some of you have heard it before. And for those of you who've heard it before, listen with new ears, new eyes. See what you didn't see before. Hear what you didn't hear before. I remember the night Ben Johnson won his gold medal at the 1988 Olympics in Seoul, Korea. I was 15 years old and I adored Ben. That night, I beamed with pride when the massive Jamaican Canadian crossed the finish line with both hands in the air, leaving Carl Lewis far behind. He became a hero to every Canadian and Jamaican around the globe. I rewound the cassette I had inserted into my mother's VCR to recapture this pivotal moment in time. Yes, I was all set. My speech about Ben would rock. I had the words and now I had a lovely piece of history to ensure I got the A plus on this project. I went to bed that night, happy as a lark. Ben had won. I just wanna pause here for a moment. Some people experience a trauma when they are in their sleep. And this sleep, as you know, is a place of rest. So when someone is, then brought immediately out of rest and into a traumatic uh, or kind of a war-like scene, it can impact for an entire lifetime. Keep that in mind. Wake up. I was blasted out of my sleep by an enormous blow to my back. I had been in a deep sleep, but was now immediately alert. What is happening? Why can't I catch my breath? Someone is yelling. Someone is yelling. It's my mother. What did you do? The force of another blow radiates across my back. What did I do? Why can't I understand her? What have I done? My mother was in a rage. And when I finally came to my senses, something she said or did told me I had crossed another line yet again. Do you know how long I've had that videotape? 
she was a raging lunatic. She had lost all self-control. She was not interested in talking or listening. She only wanted to punish. Who gave you permission to use my VCR? She kept hitting me as she hurled darts of insults at me. I couldn't speak and the fists just kept coming. My sister and I shared a small bedroom at 15 Pittsburgh Drive. We had moved from 1154 Wilson Avenue to Pittsburgh about a year after our arrival in Canada. I hated the place and longed for the freedom and the charm of my home in Jamaica and for the people I knew and loved who appreciated me. Pittsburgh was a social housing complex that offered my mother the opportunity to pay rent here to income. I felt no connection to the community and often wondered why my mother had brought us there. All my friends lived outside the neighborhood and people often commented on how different we were. People still comment on how different I am. They spoke out loud something I often asked myself. Why don't I fit in? Why am I so different? In this house, there were three small bedrooms. My mother had forced a queen size bed into our room that took up three quarters of the floor space. My sister and I shared a dresser that took up the rest of it. As my mother stood over me, I had nowhere to run or hide. She and the evil that overcame her consumed the remaining space in the room. My mother got tired of hitting me with her fists and looked for an object to continue her assault. She found the white pumps I had worn to my grade eight graduation. The pain of the heel digging into my legs was excruciating, causing me to thrash about to escape the blows. It hurt so badly I could no longer hear what she was saying. I turned onto my back and kicked my legs to avoid the blows, and it was then that I was able to land a strong kick directly into my mother's chest. She stumbled backward into the wall, and as she did, she came out of the dark trance that had overtaken her. A look of complete horror, horror guilt, shame, and regret immediately washed over her face. And without a word, she left our room. This is a tidal wave. A tidal wave of total defeat crashed over me and I sank into my bed and cried. I had looked into the eyes of hate and evil and it crushed me. In that moment, I felt weak, hopeless, and utterly powerless. As I sobbed and tried to console myself, I made the decision that life, this life was too much to bear. I made my death wish. I made many decisions that night that no 15 year old should make. I am not good. I am not worthy of loving. I am not deserving of happiness. No one is there for me. From this point forward, I'm on my own. There is no love. No one will ever do this to me again. I will never have children. I wish I were dead. In 1 Corinthians 13, Paul speaks of all the qualities of love. Love, he declares, is patient and kind. It is gentle, supportive, calm, humble, respectful, forgiving, enduring, righteous, trustworthy, and accepting. I used to think love has an opposite, but love hasn't one. Love just is. Love reflects light, peace, hope, joy, and, for, and faithfulness. That night, my mother became an instrument through which the spirit of fear that had lingered in our family for generations poured its toxic brew into my life. Fear is angry and obnoxious, malicious and loud, empty and boastful, quick-tempered and proud vexing and envious, shaming and selfish. Fear is evil, an uncontrollable dragon poised to devour us, especially the young. It blinds us to the truth that love is all there is. Fear forces us to kneel and hold on to its throne as our source of strength. That night, I clasped the feet of fear for dear life and I pulled in tight. The light I was born with dimmed, but it did not go out. I never attempted to kill myself. Life continued with all my decisions. The next day I lied to my teacher about having my period and asking her to excuse me from gym class. I knew if she saw my legs, the Children's Aid Society would be called. I ended my relationship with my first boyfriend, a very nice boy who deserved an explanation. I gave him none. I got an A plus for my speech as anticipated. My mother's anger never erupted in the same way again. But the dark shadow of fear, anger, self-loathing would invade 
every corner of my life. So I want you to notice your response to the story. Notice where you've gone in your mind. Notice if you're a little bit sad. Notice if you're in that place of blaming and wondering why. Notice if you're desiring because you're angry or appalled for humanity to do it different. Notice if it's hard for you to refocus. If you're kind of having that bit of an airy out of body kind of experience, kind of like a floating uh, experience, we call it dissociation. And so sometimes when people are triggered, they can experience that. So just take a nice deep breath and just come back. Just come back as in a, it, slowly. It doesn't have to be abrupt. Just come back to yourself. When you die, what will people say about you? So I didn't just describe a physical death. I described a spiritual death. And what will people say about me after that? On this night in 1988, I abandoned myself in my true nature. And I became the very image of what you just saw in that room. A darkness with a character of rage and anger and bitterness and insensitivity and criticism and judgment and scorn and contempt and control overcame me. It beat me again and again and again through various life experiences, but more so spiritually. I wanted to do good. I wanted to do better, but I was trapped. I was trapped in the wave. Matthew 6, verse 22 to 23 says this. It's a really special passage of scripture for me. And it took me years to understand this passage of scripture. But Christ says, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body is full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? I was baptized at age 10. I believed in Christ, never lost my faith, or so I thought. Even in this moment, always relied on Christ, went through high school, um, teaching Bible study classes. Even when I went to university, started Bible study classes, I had no idea the dark light I was in. It was only when I started to do forgiveness, to learn what forgiveness really meant and then went on my conscious forgiveness journey that I understood I was filled with a dark light. Most Christians carry a dark light and they don't even know it. And the thing is, no one could ever tell you that you are in a dark light. You wouldn't understand it, first of all, and then you would totally disagree with them. I'm in Christ. What do you mean I'm in the darkness? <laughs> If you're unhealed, and most of us are, you're in the darkness. And only Christ can show you that. Matthew 5 verse 16 says this, let your light shine before men. I'm re repeating the scripture. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good deeds and your moral excellence and recognize and honor and glorify your father who is in heaven. So it would take me yet many years to understand the purpose of that moment in the room. And once I understood, this was my moment. This was my moment of being exposed to good and then want or evil, but wanting goodness. And this was my moment of choosing. But I would put a pause on it and I would go through the desert like the Israelites did for 40 years before I would make the decision to step into the true light. And it was once I made that decision, I could end my resentment towards my mother. I could end my resentment towards God. I could stop saying this never should have happened because I recognized the spiritual purpose of this moment and the significance of the choice that I had made. With understanding, I could now have compassion for that 15 year old girl. I could embrace her. I could cry with her. I could allow her to diffuse that bomb that she carried around with her all the time. And with understanding, 
I was able to finally choose goodness and step into that place where the true light began to show up. Choosing goodness requires transformation. This is why I say it is not enough that you believe in Christ. You must choose to transform and become the very image of Christ. It requires that you become a Matthew 5 person. If you take a look at Matthew 5, and I, I'm just going to turn there now because I, I need to see all the headers. When you look at Matthew 5, what you will notice is that the first part of that passage of scripture is talking about the Beatitudes. It's the Sermon on the Mount. And goodness requires that we then embrace each of the Beatitudes. And I won't read all of them, but this is the journey. Transformation requires that if we are to then say, I am of Christ, Blessed, I'm just going to read one, spiritually prosperous, happy to be admired, are the poor in spirits, those devoid of spiritual arrogance, those who regard themselves as insignificant, for theirs is the kingdom of God. There's so much depth just to that one verse. I could stay in Matthew 5, and I have stayed in Matthew 5 for years upon years, just soaking up the wisdom that is here. So we pursue the Beatitudes. What you'll notice after the Beatitudes, then the next part that comes is then Christ talks about being the salt and then the light of the world. So we have to seek to be the salt. And there's such wisdom that's connected with that and meaning that is connected with that. And of course, the light. Hold the light. Walk in the light. After that, there's a passage of scripture that comes. And there was a point in time where I was asking Christ, what is the message that I am to bring? And he pointed me to Matthew 5, verses 17. And that says, do not think that I came to do away with or undo the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And the rest of it goes on to talk about um, the ways in which we are to pursue the laws. The laws are written in our hearts. Christ, when he is fully risen in each of us, is the fulfillment of the law. Water and the spiritual baptism is the fulfillment of the law. Spiritually maturing in love is the fulfillment of the law. What will they say about you when you die? I experienced something really beautiful when my mother died. It's almost as though her body was laid on one of those platforms and a whole bunch of wood was added to it and then it was lit on fire and then her body was allowed to go or you know all the parts of her and the ashes were allowed to go into the atmosphere and then i was able to just take a nice deep breath and breathe it all in there was a wisdom that my mother carried that she never spoke and yet there was this beautiful release that happened at the time that she died where I was able to just soak it all in and experience her in a totally different way. The same thing happened with Christ. After Christ died, there was a release of an eternal wisdom called the Holy Spirit. Joel 2 verse 28 says, It shall come about after this that I shall pour out my spirit on all mankind, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy and your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. Even on the male and the female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Hebrews 10 verse 16 to 17 also speaks of the period after Christ. This is the covenant. And this is Hebrews 10, 16 to 17. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will imprint my laws upon their heart and on their minds, and I will inscribe them, producing an inward change. And he then says, and their sins and their lawless acts, I will remember no more, no longer holding their sins against them. Now where there is absolute forgiveness and complete cancellation of the penalty of these things, there is no longer an offering to be made to atone for sins. I am often perplexed by the church 
and how little the church focuses on healing. We motivate people, we tell them they should do this and do that and listen to the word and Christ did this, so you, do, you can do that. But it takes work to heal. And we seem unwilling to acknowledge that Christ is in us and because Christ is in us, we now have the power and the privilege not only of healing ourselves with Christ, but of healing other people. And yet the church is silent on the matter. The church doesn't know how to activate healing uh, other than to say, oh, in Jesus name, you are healed. What do you mean by that? <laughs> what do you mean by that? You have no power. Christ is in you. God is in you. The Holy Spirit is in you, but you have no power other than to call on Jesus who is out there. What a kind of madness. So Christians who choose Christ, but refuse to transform and actively engage in the transformation process, you are going against the Holy Spirit. I really shouldn't say refuse. I think most of us know we must transform, but we take no ownership in the experience. And that's what really what I'm trying to motivate today. I, we must experience goodness and we must experience the evil. If we must choose goodness, if we must choose to become like Christ, then we must also choose to transform. So how do we choose to transform? The first thing we must do is we must heal. Jesus didn't go out and preach to people. He healed people. And you will notice in every healing, what did he say? Your sins are forgiven. Go and sin no more. Jesus had a way of seeing into us. He had a way of seeing our history. He had a way of reading it. And almost immediately by his spirit, he was able to help us reshape it and craft it in a new understanding. And with that new understanding, freedom comes. I will speak the truth and the truth will set you free. Mahatma Gandhi put something that Jesus said. He said, as a man thinketh, so he is. And there's phases to our thinking. Mahatma Gandhi said, your beliefs become your thoughts. Just your beliefs. What I believe becomes my thought. So what do you believe about Christ? What are you thinking about Christ? Your thoughts become your words. So what are you thinking about Christ and what do you say about Christ? Your words become your actions. So, okay, your actions say Jesus Christ forgave, Jesus Christ healed, Jesus Christ did all of these things, but are you? Your actions become your habit. What habitual thinking actions are you engaged in? And how do those shape your values? The things that you prioritize, the things that you put front and center. How then does that shape where you end up Belief, destination, belief, destination, belief, destination, belief, transformation, belief, transformation, belief, transformation. That should be our destination. Conscious forgiveness is required by all of us. So when we forgive someone, we have to go back to the moment where we experience the goodness. Well, goodness is experience, but where we experience the evil, we go back there. And we have to wonder at how did that moment shape our beliefs about ourselves, about others, about the world, about God? Because those beliefs then are shaping our thoughts, our thoughts then shape the words we use, our words then shape the actions. When a client comes in, I notice the things that they say right away. And when they say something two or three times, I go, you say that a lot. And then I wonder, where does that belief find its source? And so as we go back to that source, I'll know I'll find the evil there that they need to overcome. Our traumas influence how we experience and how we view God. And for a long time, I carried a hidden belief that was punishing, that God was punishing me. So I wouldn't even have known it had I not been on a healing journey if I didn't have a technique for assessing certain beliefs at certain times, like if I read a passage of scripture in the Bible, 
God is all there is. God is in us. God is through us. God is above us. God is over us. I can test each of those statements. Do I believe God is in me? Do I believe God is through every single one of us? Do I believe God is above me and over me? Is God good? I can test that statement. So I wouldn't have known if I didn't have these techniques. So I held these two conflicting beliefs. One, God is my protector. God is my shield. God is my safe place. God is the place that I can run into. And I held this belief, God is my punisher. And when you have a belief that is inconsistent, guess what happens? You create situations where you see both things. So what would I do? I create a situation where I was being punished just so that I could call on God and say, protect me. <laughs> no pause. So we must desire to come out of it. It's a big old loop and we have to end it. We end it when we love completely and allow love to drive out the darkness. We have come to know, I'm, I'm reading now from 1 John 4 verses 16 to 18. We have come to know by personal observation and experience and have believed with deep, consistent faith the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides continually in him. In this union and fellowship with him, love is completed and perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment with assurance and boldness to face him. Because as he is, so we are in this world. There is no fear in love. Dread does not exist. A perfect, complete, full-grown love drives out fear because fear involves the expectation of divine punishment so that the one who is afraid of God's judgment is not perfected in love. That is, they have not grown into a sufficient understanding of God's love. It's a deep passage of scripture. I've, I've read that so many times. And as I read it every single time, something new comes from it. We are told there is no evil in God. We are told there is no darkness in God. Time and again, we see the sentiments of Joshua 1 verse 9 repeated. It says, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified or dismayed or intimidated for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. We did a mantra for um, a time of prayer not too long ago. And the mantra was this, where God is, I am, right? Wherever I am, God is. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. The Holy Spirit is in each of us. And the only thing we have to do is activate Holy Spirit and allow the Spirit of Christ and the presence of Christ and the light of Christ to rise in each of us. Fear is the darkness. And if you find yourself afraid, speaking fear, speaking about things that you think are going to happen that never happen, this is the kind of darkness that you need to denounce. Fear comes from the encounter with evil. Love is the light. God is love. God is the light. The path to forgiveness requires a daily sacrifice. Time to examine ourselves is a sacrifice. Time to heal is a sacrifice. Time to adjust our false beliefs, our negative thoughts, those violent words that we use, the unholy actions and the habits that we form, and the values that go against God. It takes time. The Bible says we are crucified with Christ. But sometimes we create a struggle where we crucify ourselves. Like, and this happens day in, day, day in, day out. We're part of it. So we have to have a belief system that is corrected, and we only correct it with healing work. We are to crucify the false identities created during the traumatic moments of our lives. That's the exposure to evil. Identities that occupy spaces of darkness and punishment and vain imaginations, those are to be crucified. We do this with prayer. We do it with songs. We do it with meditation and the word. 
the word is revealing. But I will tell you that these are not enough. Forgiveness is the requirement. Conscious forgiveness heals. It reshapes our beliefs. It delivers us. There's a reason why every healing and deliverance in the Bible begins with the word, you are forgiven. Go and sin no more is what follows. Forgiveness is the key, it's the path of Christ. And this is what we walk. So I'd like to come to a close now. And I just, I put the same question out that I started with. What will they say about you when you die? Will they say that that was a good spirit? who understood what the journey was about, who fulfilled, who fulfilled the request, those threefold reasons for living. Will they say that or will they remain silent? So I'm gonna close with an affirmative prayer. I want you to just pause for a moment. Let's just go into a time of silence before I pray. I'm gonna pray, I'm gonna play a song um, and as I play that song, just be in a place of meditation. Just allow the words uh, to permeate and allow yourself to zoom in on those things that spoke to you. And just allow yourself to meditate with God as the song plays and then afterwards we'll pray. Blessed are the ones who do not bury all the broken pieces of their heart. Blessed are the tears of all the weary, pouring like a sky of falling stars. Blessed are the wounded ones in morning brave enough to show the Lord their scars blessed are the hurts that are not hidden open to the healing touch of God the kingdom is yours the kingdom
still have strength to love their enemy. Blessed is the faith of those who persevere. For though they fall, they'll never know defeat. The kingdom is yours. pray together. I'm going to say an affirmative prayer and I'm going to engage you uh, in the process as we go through. One of the first things I'm going to ask you to do as we pray together is to just focus on God in whatever way um, you need to. The name for God is Jehovah Rapha and that is the God of healing. If that's the place where you're needing some attention today, um, focus on that name. If you are uh, wanting community or communion. Focus on Emmanuel uh, as that name. Focus on the ultimate, Jehovah, um, as the one who loves all um, and who has created all. After we connect with the name of God and as we connect with the God who is in us and through us and above us and over us, the next thing we'll do is we'll step into a place of oneness recognizing that we go inward to heal, then we come outward to know the Christ that is in all others, and then we know the ultimate God who is above all, the God, the greatest God of all. Next, we'll enter into a place of acknowledging those shortcomings, the things that prevent us from connecting with God, the negative thoughts, the false belief, the traumatic moments that we've been wailing against, the things that we protest against that should not happen, one of the things that I did not say, but the healing journey is about encountering people that then trigger us. That's how we remember and go back to the place where we encountered evil. That is the place where we then forgive. So for those of us who haven't been able to do that, or I haven't been able to receive that, I hope you receive that today. Next, we will put before God our request. Whatever your request is at that point, you can make it known. And then we'll end in the place of just leave it there before God. Allow yourself to visualize God picking up that request and then ushering out um, and a series of actions that can bring it all together. So let's begin. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you are Jehovah Rapha, the great and wonderful healer. We thank you that you are Elohim. We thank you that you are Emmanuel. We thank you for Christ our wonderful Redeemer. We thank you that Christ sits at your right hand and that we sit at Christ's right hand. We thank you that Christ petitions for us to come into unity with us. So we focus on you, Jehovah. We focus on you, God of light. We focus on you, God of love. We focus on you who are our provider and our protector, our shield in times of trouble, our refuge, our place that we can run into. We acknowledge you, O oh God, for all that you are. We acknowledge your goodness. We acknowledge your divine nature and your character. We thank you for your forgiveness, for all the ways in which you have looked after us, for all the ways in which you've created a path for us. We thank you. Incomplete gratitude. We thank you 
that through Christ, your Holy Spirit was released and poured into all of us. We acknowledge that your laws now are written on our minds and our hearts. And today we activate, we activate the Holy Spirit within us And we ask for your Holy Spirit to now transform us through the experiences that we have. We join in communion with you as you bring everything towards us that would help us heal and help us give up the darkness that has invaded us. Father, we ask that as we come into that place of oneness, your light would consume us. Your light would permeate through our very essence and that we begin to shine, that we begin to see the place of unity with your light, where we can indeed be that city, that great city on that hill, that great light that guides others. As we come into this place of oneness with you, we accept your offer to hold the light. We accept your offer to walk with us as we walk in your light. Father, with all gratitude in our hearts, we acknowledge all the things that you have done for us. We thank you for Harriet. We thank you for the ways in which she was kept safe. We thank you for all the wonderful work that she is doing in her community. We ask for you to continue to bless her life in all the ways that she should be blessed in this moment so that she can rise. We thank you for every person that is on this uh, platform today We thank you for the goodness that you are wanting to raise up in each of them. I thank you for the light. I thank you for the love that you have poured into me. I thank you for my family. I thank you for good friends. I thank you for business growth and opportunity. I thank you for Catherine, the life she has lived, the leadership that she offers to this body of believers, the ways in which she helps us to transform into the light to grow in all the ways that we should. And Father, even with the message that we've spoken today, I thank you for releasing that message to me. I pray that as it goes out now, it will touch the hearts and minds of your followers in all the ways that it should. I pray that it will inspire them to pursue a healing journey, no matter where they are in life, to pursue a transformation journey, and that they embrace your Holy Spirit as they do both. And Father, now we place our request before you. And so I'm just going to offer a moment of silence. Just place your request before the throne of God, knowing that we are in a place of oneness and communion with him. Whatever it is that you need to request, just speak it out now. Father, we pray to be fearless in this life. We pray to be light. We pray for deliverance from the darkness. We pray for the healing of the moments in which we experience evil. We pray for the opening of eyes to know what the experience was all about. We pray to revisit it in all the ways that we should. And we pray to choose goodness, holiness, and righteousness. We choose life. We choose you. We choose to become the very image of Christ. Father, we have laid all these things at your feet. And we know, we know that with your guidance, it is already so. We will not doubt that it is so. We believe completely that when we ask and we come into a place of complete agreement with the unity of your Holy Spirit, it is already so. We know that prayer is the one thing that transforms the heart, the mind, and the spirit. We know that you can see us. You can see our memories. You can see our history. You know the things we are blind to. Open our eyes. You know the things we deny open our eyes. You know the things that make us foolish, open our eyes. You know the things we toss away, 
open our eyes, illumine us by the power and the grace of Christ, by the power and the grace of your Holy Spirit. We leave these things with you now in Jesus' name. Amen.